Yeah, hey, hi, this is Dan Hank. Welcome to another edition of the Skull Session Podcast. And today my guest is Richard Sparks. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. Okay, awesome. So tell me what you got going on, Richard. Well, uh, I've been a script writer and writer of many things all my life, and I've just about had my first novel published at the grand old age of nearly 29, so it's taken a while, I wish. Um, it, uh, <laughs> I, I've written four in the series. It's a very good publishing house, American publishing house called Kazik, S-F-S-C-A-E-Z-I-K. They specialize in science fiction and fantasy. And I'm thrilled to be up on their website, on their author page, I'm next to Robert A. Heinlein. <laughs> that is so cool because you know, he's he's a he's a master. It's just it goes Richard Robert. I just got lucky. It's done by first. Name. <laughs> um, but but they publish his stuff, which is awesome. They publish him. Uh, they publish you know, living writers and republish uh, classics from the old right. days. And um, they're very very good stable. I'm I'm thrilled to be with them, and uh, I hope that they are uh, pleased with the results, which will you know. The book's coming out on the 12th of December, the audiobook a week later, which I did myself. I recorded that here. And I, I'm going to start name dropping at you. I, you know, the guy, Fred Sanders, who did the production, the direction, also did the Game of Thrones book. Oh, that's awesome. That's, yeah, with Roy Dotrice, an yeah, actor, yeah. a British actor, a lovely British actor who was in Beauty and the Beast, which George R.R. R. Martin was one of the writers on. And they became great friends. And I saw Roy Dotrice play my my ancestor in a Shakespeare play years and years ago. He Who's played your ancestor? He's called Harry Hotspur. He was the son of the Earl of Northumberland, and he was a rebel, and he had a fight against Henry the, the, the future Henry V, Prince Hal. I saw it twice, and both times my guy lost. It was rotten, <laughs> but it was a great production. <laughs> so, yeah, we, I, yeah, yeah, having uh, lived for a while now, you get sort of odd connections like that. I, you know, not, I write operas and music and, and lyrics for uh, films, s uh, songs, with Lee Holdridge, who's the composer of Beauty and the Beast, the TV series. So I said to him, you know, what's it like? What was that like? And he said, well, every week you get a great script from Ron Coslow or George Martin. It was heaven. And, and that was the first show to be through composed. There's music every second of that. And Lee was the composer. Uh, so I'm kind of, in a way, George R. R. Martin's step writing partner via Lee Holdridge, <laughs> which is, I mean, it's like, cool. like five degrees from Kevin Bacon. Yeah, exactly. Thing, yeah. Five, five degrees, what, two degrees of Kevin Bacon in that case. So I'll take that. That's a, that's because I'm a huge fan of George Martin's, and was very relieved that the the TV show was so good. I thought, oh God, they're going to ruin it. I, I thought it was great, like the best thing yeah. on TV until that last season. The last oh, the season ending. was oh. horrible, yeah. Oh, but the end, even end. George R. R. Martin came out and was like, I would not have done that. And what I heard, I don't know if it's true, what I heard is he said, I want 12 seasons. They said, we want six. The compromise was eight. And like the, the writing team, they ran out of source material, you know, yeah. completely by episode seven. So you kind of see episode seven going down a little bit. And then yeah. eight is just all out of their head. It's the, the worst ever. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, think, I think he probably gave them some steering towards what he was thinking about, but um, they're not as good writers as he is. It's as simple as that. I mean, close, uh, those, yeah. those showrunners were excellent showrunners, but they're inexperienced script writers. And well, the, it, what, what I heard too is I heard that they got the contract for the new Star Wars movie, like the oh, new really? trilogies, oh. and um, they did so badly on that last season, they got fired. <laughs> oh my God, that's so sad. You, uh, oh, that, no, because I mean, we owe them a huge debt of thanks for bringing that show to TV. And the weird thing was, at um, Beauty and the Beast time, back it was the 80s, I think, George was uh, writing that. And apparently he said at the time, I've never met him, but I will soon, I hope. Um, he said, um, I'm going to go away and write something so big, nobody will ever think of filming it. <laughs> and that was the Game of Thrones uh, series. And, the song uh, uh, Fire and Ice, uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, they filmed it, and it was it was magic uh, up until it uh, wasn't, right? Yeah, well, it, it's I I think part of the reason why people were so disappointed with that last season was because it was so good. Prior to that, yeah, like, yeah, I, absolutely, absolutely right. I remember doing guest spots in Scotland, and I'd be in Scotland and see billboards for Game of Thrones. Yeah, like, like yeah. it's big here, but it's like big all over the world. Oh, it's massive! It's just yeah. massive. Yeah. 
Well, I've let's hope we do. I've sold the film rights to New Rock and New Roll and written the script, so we shall see. It doesn't you know, it doesn't actually mean anything until until we're in production, but at least right. somebody wants to do it. So, well, sometimes they throw you money, even if they don't make it. But it's always better if they make it. Well, I also know the producer, and he's uh, he's he gets my 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 form of thinking, my sense of humor, and he's right behind it. So uh, over to him now. Um, meanwhile, I get my head back into the next book. So what what is this about? Like the one that you have coming up, like what's the name of it? When does it debut? And um, you you said you mentioned sci-fi. What kind of sci-fi? Because there's like a whole slew of different genres. Like everything yeah, I, from like cosmic horror, like Event Horizon, to way more realistic, like The Expanse. Well, it's fantasy rather than science fiction. <clears throat> and it, as you can tell by the title of the, well, here's, 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 a, here's a card even. You rock, you roll, R-O-L-E. Yeah, okay. I, I, I think you told me that you do science fiction and fantasy. Uh, no, uh, I uh, no, I just do fantasy. I um, but <laughs> so I, I read. Off. <laughs> no, yeah, you've got fifty percent of me right. I read anything. Right. Uh, it, this came out of my love of role playing games, which I discovered massively multiplayer online role playing games. Uh, I played all sorts. I particularly like the sword and sorcery world, magic, those big open worlds that you can just wander around in and have fun. I don't like the first person shooter types because. That's just target practice, really. Yeah, it's kind of boring. Uh, they don't yeah, have well, a story. Just, they don't have a good story. Well, like, exactly. People love that, those old ones. They have such great stories. Now, that's where I come in, because the problem with role-playing games that are already ri written is the stories are limited. They're already written by writers, so they, it looks like you can go anywhere, but the quests are set to some extent, to a large extent. And there are only two quests, in, whether it's set in outer space or Japanese Yakuza gangster lad or sword and sorcery middle ages there are only two quests we call them kill or fedex go and kill something or go and fetch something but if you're using how, narrative, how would, sorry how would you classify the witcher well the witcher is, is a sword and sorcery world but right. the quest the quests in it are either go and kill something or go and fetch something and they're great right. fun i did the witcher 2 loved it did i do witcher 3 i can't remember um but yeah those three those is the last word with henry cavill so I I don't know. I'll check out the new one. I haven't seen I haven't seen the show. I just did played the games. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, but they're Polish originally. So um, yeah. So because of if you're using the conventions of narrative writing, you can do far more than just go kill something, go fetch something. You can set puzzles that our characters have got to solve, uh, like a detective sto not story, where you go through it with the detective trying to figure it out, and they're trying to figure out these puzzles that come their way. In a game, you just get bored and Google the answer, but you can't do that with my book. You know, and, and it's fun. It's the way it unfolds. They're page turners, their adventures, and because of my background in comedy writing, there's a, a lot of laughs in there. You know, you know, comedy's not nice people telling jokes. That's a dinner party. Comedy is fear and pain and misery. Well, my favorite is going horribly is like wrong. The, the Monty Python. I, I know that, uh, like, with a lot of the you know American audience, it's a little bit like. Too dry wit, too sarcastic. They want more like Adam Sandler or whatever. But I thought that was hysterical. Oh, it is. Uh, you know, comedy is about things like, going, going wrong. Like the Holy Grail of the Life of Brian. Uh, I mean, how do you go uh, wrong with that? Come back. It's only a flesh wound. Yeah, now, yeah. I've, I've, I've worked with all of them, except Terry Gilliam, who I've met. Uh, and I used to share an agent with Michael oh, Palin. A brilliant director. Terry I love Jones. Directing. Yeah. Yeah, Terry Jones, Michael Palin. They moved off with the other Pythons. Graham Chapman stayed with the agent Jill Foster, as uh, Douglas Adams was one of her writers. And many That's also writers. a great writer, yeah. I love yeah, his he's, stuff. He, he's an exact contemporary of mine. I knew him in the old days. I was actually just telling this story on a another interview. Some Someone said, you know, asked about Douglas, and I said, I first heard about Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. There was a, a, a girl I fancied, and we arranged to have a date, went to her local pub, and um, there was Jeff McGiven at the bar, the actor. I said, oh, hey, Jeff, how are you? He said, oh, great. You know, Douglas has written a radio series, and I'm in it. There's a part for me. I said, oh, wonderful. What's it called? And he said, A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And I said, oh, great title, and then scuttled off to my date. I didn't want a handsome young actor butting in and being charming. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's the first I heard of it. And Douglas, you know, as I said, he was already a friend, and 
uh, you know, he's, he's much missed. So very, uh, very sad he died so young. I mean, I wish he was still alive. He might say something nice about my book. Yeah, or, or I'd throttle him. Well, no, he's twice. Right, <laughs> throttle him. <laughs> well, he, he's in, he was enormous. He, he actually worked as a bodyguard. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. He was a sweetie, but he looked frightening if he wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> so he he did more like sci-fi. You do a little bit more fantasy. Yes, like, yes. Was I it think. kind of an overlap in that? No, uh, not really. I, you know, as I said, I love the sword and sorcery world. So I've basically the premise of the book is these. The, the hero is a retired British school teacher living alone in his little bungalow on the edge of a, an English town and playing um, role playing games where his life is much more interesting than his dull retirement. And his team is an Australian player whose avatar is an orc called Grell, and Creaster, who's the dual wielding sword dancing avatar of an Asian American girl. And the three of them get so good that they end up winning the world championship of sword and sorcery live online in front of tens of millions of people, just like the, the Fortnite was. the moment, When I finished that book, the Fortnite championship was on with 30 million people watching live. That weekend I finished it. I was going, wow. And so and then the next thing they know, it goes very weird indeed. And he's sucked out of that virtual world that he's in and finds himself standing alone on a hillside with a crappy sword and a shield going, what the fuck? You know? And he's, he's, and he sees he, he's his own avatar. For real. Why do you say the sword and the shield are crappy? Well, because he's a beginner, basically he's back to beginner level, having been right. an expert. Oh, having yeah. From heroes to zeros. You know, they won the world championship. Next. So, you know, obviously <coughs> they won the world championship. Somebody was watching and wants to see how well they do in this new world. It's not a game. They come out of a game. It's all it's all a <coughs> so I got my own own world, my own universe to play in. And I can't believe my luck in finding it. So the general theme of your book is it all kind of in the same universe? Is like everything kind of connected? Yeah, yeah. It's well, the first book is called New Rock, New Roll. The second is New Rock, New Realm, where our heroes go overseas to solve whatever happens there. Is like one a direct sequel to the other? Yeah, or? yeah, exactly. I mean, I I've seen some books which I've really admired that have sequels that shouldn't have been written because there is no possible sequel really? you know, the book the book ends so perfectly there's no there's no sequel mine i deliberately wanted it to be open-ended and i've left a lot of little that thre seems threads sorry, i can use later sorry Go. to interrupt you no, no. that that seems like with sci-fi like they'll come out with like a great first book but then they have trouble expanding the universe fantasy it actually seems to be the opposite yeah yeah indeed and look george um uh tolkien three books for the lord of the rings um mervyn peak three books for uh um the gorman gas trilogy douglas i think called his <laughs> hitchhiker a, a trilogy in three part four parts or something <laughs> with typical douglas wit but you know somebody once described it to me recently as this is ready player one meets lord of the rings in Discworld," and i thought <laughs> well okay Okay, I mean, kind of, yeah, but you know, it's a sword and sorcery world. It's got the, it's got humor like Terry's uh, Discworld does. Uh, different. His his is more tongue in cheek. Mine is just my. I don't try and write like anyone else. That so would be stupid. I, I couldn't. Um, uh, but that's uh, anyway. It's 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 been a joy to discover this, and uh, I'm currently writing book five. I you. Well, you might not be surprised. There are so many people that tell me they're inspired by Dungeons and Dragons. They're like, <clears throat> yeah, the whole reason I started was because, like, I won't even ask them. They'll just mention it. And I'm like, this probably even more. They won't mention it. But yeah, that, that inspired everybody because it's like a whole world building thing. You know? Yeah. It seems like a lot of people are kind of missing that. And it's kind of coming back a little bit with like the Game of Thrones and the Witcher and the Wheel of Time and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right. At Dungeons and Dragons, I first saw my brother-in-law playing it in London. He, when he was at university, he's American. He went to London University with his nerdy mates sitting around playing and throwing dice. And I thought, blimey, that looks weird. And then, oh yeah, Douglas Adams was into video games uh, back in the nineties. And I said, what are these things? These are for kids, aren't they? And he said, no, they're amazing. And sort of, I'm always a bit late to the party, mm. discovered them uh, in the, well, probably about 15 years ago, and they just kept getting better and better and better. Now I don't have time to play them, really. <laughs> because, <laughs> and funnily enough, there's some big thing in England uh, with the um, 
they, they've asked me to write articles about it on the angle of the the older gamers, uh, you know, because people in their retirement are doing teams, doing you know, they have plenty of time on their hands. So you know, it's not just for seventeen year old nerds anymore; it's for everybody. I, I'm amazed people make serious money off playing video games now. Huh? I would never have thought when I was a little kid that that was going to happen. Absolutely extraordinary. Um, Esports is the same thing. Now, I'm not into that competitive stuff, and I just love the worlds. And they, thanks to those incredible worlds that the designers have built for us, I got this idea, and I'm really plowing the same furrow as era, you know many of the writers since well Greek times. You know, there's, there's harpies and monsters and cyclops in uh, in the Odyssey of Homer. Yeah, Beowulf is a is fantasy with the dragon and a hoard of treasure and a monster and the monster's mother living at the bottom of the lake. Shakespeare, you know, the nineteenth century. Then all the well, I'm Norwegian. I've read all the Norwegian myths. Like it, I, yeah. I was reading them as a kid. There are yeah. so many monsters and frost giants and all that yeah. sort of thing. It's oh, like, yeah, I pillage all that. I mean, I do my own twist on it. You know, when you're young, you're asked about who are your influences, and you feel a bit affronted as someone's kind of saying you're stealing ideas from um, you know dickens or something but now when you realize actually we're all we're all working together it's all i'm happy to be part of the tradition to be part of the culture yeah I, I would say i wouldn't say you're stealing ideas i'd say you're, you're using them you're inspired by that like yeah. how many people have been inspired by like lovecraft or yeah. paul or there like mary shelley you know yeah absolutely oh, she's that i mean she was only 20 when she published frankenstein i think extraordinary well i know there was like the writer group it was like all guys except for her and uh you know they had a challenge and they're like yeah you can participate she blew a ball away <laughs> yeah she certainly did I, I was watching outtakes from young frankenstein last week i think on youtube you know, late at night when i stopped writing I, go, I either watch billy strings who i'm a huge fan of or um silly things like that and that the outtakes of gene wilder and everyone corpsing as they were shooting young Frankenstein. They're just priceless. Uh. So let's get back to your work for a minute. I'm sure we could talk about uh, influence forever. Yeah, but um, so how many books do you have out and when did you start putting them out? The first one comes out on December the 12th, 2023. The others will be published uh, at yearly intervals. And the publishers actually said, look, slow down. We can't keep up with this. And I said, well, I'm just keep writing them for the, I want to see what happens next. I want to see what my guys get up to. And he said, look, in the old days, pulp fiction writers used to write under several different names because the publishers didn't want clogging up of their uh, works in, the, in their lists. And they had to make a living, especially if they're writing magazine articles as well. It, well, they also got paid by the word. So they exactly. kind of puffed them up a little bit. You know. Right. It, no, so it I'm like slight Good. Slightly different position. Well, just a slightly different position, but you know, I I've always wanted to be a fiction writer. I'm happy to take every job I could get as a writer of scripts and so on. But to me, the pinnacle of writing is narrative fiction. Uh, I tried before in, in various efforts, and they were all not good enough. I'm glad to say they weren't published. But this is this is it, uh, and it's just you know because writing scripts is well, film is a director's medium. Stage is an actor's medium. Opera is a composer's medium and a singer's medium. Narrative fiction, it's just me. It's its a writer's medium with a, a narrative voice that you don't have if you're writing a script. The writer's voice is uh, Im important. Uh, well, I figure know. also when you write stuff, you can, you know, you're not constrained by like a, like technical ability, like, like technology, like CGI, whatever. It's like whatever you come up with for your world, if you make it convincing, it's convincing. Absolutely, absolutely, and it, yeah, I remember telling the same the old joke to Douglas about when he was trying to get the film of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy made when he was over here in LA. You know, Douglas, the pictures are better on radio <laughs> because <it's> for, <laughs> if, if you've never listened, please listen to the original radio series of Hitchhiker. It's it's just fabulous, great cast, really charmingly done, and uh, then he turned it into that great book, of course, but. Yeah, the pictures are wonderful in that. I remember listening to it in London and Douglas's world taking us all over the place. Great stuff. So, is this your first like novel? Like, uh, you, you said you had like a bunch of other. Well, it's my first. It's my first published novel. I wrote various 
things that were well i mean got some nice rejections agents were happy to send them <laughs> out but, but what i learned is you know i tried different genres like comic novel and one detective novel and one literary novel that was utter crap i stopped halfway down page 385 i thought i wouldn't want to read this why am i putting myself through this let alone anyone else it's just i'm the wrong fit for me but i learned a lot learned learned of you know what i shouldn't do so uh when this came up uh yes uh, this is my first published novel but it's been something i've always longed to do and i was i, I would have gone to my grave regretting not having fulfilled the uh, gifts i've been given uh w if i hadn't come up with something that really is a fit for me i mean nobody else could have written these anyone else could have written the others and um they're welcome to them. <laughs> They're in the bottom drawer there, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so you play this one being a series, like uh, like uh, several books afterwards? I've written four. Uh, the f second one will be coming out next, you know, year after the first. They come up every year. Uh, and I'm on the fifth at the moment. And I'll just keep writing them until I drop, I hope. Or I, I might run out of ideas. You never know. Okay. Uh, and, and generally, how long are they? They're about 170,000 words. They're pretty long. And the, one of the reasons for that is I like it. I like a book that's a good wallow that you don't right. like the Game of Thrones books are three times that length, probably. But they're just <laughs> su such fun to lose yourself in. And then when you get to the end, you go, oh, I want to know how it ends, but I don't want it to end. So in a way, I, no, I, I love the older books where they have a, like a lot of backstory. Yeah, you know, like like uh, I don't know if you read uh, Lucifer's Hammer. You know, it, it's about this giant meteorite that slams into the earth and like it becomes apocalyptic overnight. But they spend like a hundred pages building up the character and the world, and then it happens. So well, then you really feel dangerous. the impact. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I mean, word building is important, but my editor, Leslie Robin at Kasich, who's brilliant, by the way, she said, look, you've got to earn your exposition. You can't just dump a load of facts on us anywhere, let alone, I mean, George Martin can, because that's his fourth book and you're already into it. If he wants to do some exposition in a chapter, you know, thousands of pages into the adventures, he's earned it. But, you know, in your first chapter, you've got to tell the story, get the story, get it going. And fill anything in that you need to while scenes are happening, while events are going on. This is fantastic advice, and she really is. I'm, I'm very, very lucky to have. I mean, her first note well, on the I, book. I think you can draw people in without necessarily having to, like, you know, slam the the big event on them right away. Exactly. You must, you must, is weave it in and out, and keep the narrative, keep the pages turning. Now, to me, narrative drive is the is the most important thing in a book. If if I read some you know often a lot of literary fiction is just wearily slow and you just think oh it's about another dysfunctional family and a poor kid is neglected and oh fuck it you know i've, I've read this <laughs> uh, sometimes you have to read them out of duty but um no i i like a, i like a i like a page turner and i noticed it's kind of the strange transition where people will write it and it's like very interesting as a read but it seems like it's a lot slower on tv well, that can be TV adaptations uh, are tricky things. So I, I started off adapting, uh, well, basically children's books. Uh, I did the famous five, the Enid Blyton series in England, which was actually the top rated children's pro series of the decade. Uh, so that did well, but they, she was a very famous uh, children's author and children's writer. So I learned on the job how to adapt a book into a, into scripts. So it's very easy for me to adapt my book into the, the film script, for example. Uh, but they are very different, and they have different demands, and they have different ways of keeping your attention. And sometimes they're better, and sometimes they're worse than the original. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's actually a rare case, you know, the, the movie or the TV series is actually better than the book, but it does happen. I've heard, I haven't seen it, I've read the uh, Mick Heron Slough House books, and I've heard that the adaptation with... 
uh, Gary Oldman as Jackson Lamb and Kristen Scott Thomas as Lady Di are, are really good. Well, so how, I, how can you go I make wrong it, with Gary Oldman? Oh, I just got I mean, that, <laughs> that guy's a he's a god. He's a, a huge Gary Oldman fan. One of my favorite Sir actors. Gary. Yeah, let's give him a knighthood, Sir Gary Oldman. <laughs> but uh, he looks just perfect in the part as this CD. The, you know, objectionable mess of an ex of a spy running as a bunch of deadbeat losers who've been, <laughs> who've been kicked out. And, and, and Heron's books are really, really good. Although you kind of have to take a, a break after one and listen to something or read something a little more lighthearted because it's, it's good. But he's just brilliant. And you look at that casting and think, that's the guy. So I, I may get around to watching that series soon. Uh, well, if you look at stuff like uh, George R. Martin's, like the Red Wedding, you know, it's like it's yeah. so shocking, and like yeah. he kind of built up that character with like Rob Stark, and they're yeah. you know going for revenge, and then all of a sudden they all die, you know. It, but yeah, and yeah. I know uh, everybody's I, like, "Oh my god, I can't believe!" It. But you know what? They draws him in, so they're well, definitely going to be there the next episode. He's uh, very brave. The the way he did in the first book is to kill the hero at the end of the first book yeah Ned no Stark. yeah you go, that was what? amazing you go what uh, what <laughs> yeah I, I was like what he's dead he got me yeah. especially yeah. he was the big star sean bean was yeah, yeah. there's a v very funny compilation on youtube of sean bean death scenes because he <laughs> dies he dies a lot in in movies and films <laughs> I, I thoroughly recommend oh, that. Wait, what else is he in oh he was in sharps regiment he was in he was uh, Boromir in the Game of Thrones films. He died in that. Uh, he dies a lot, Sean. He's, he's, <laughs> he died a lot. <laughs> that, that's especially that's what he's known for dying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, All right. So, is, is there a series that you say kind of uh, you know captures what you want? Um, like, like you know, if people are like, "Hey, um, you know, I'm not sure if I should check this out. What is it kind of like?" And you say, "Well, you know." I didn't rip this off, but I was kind of inspired by this. Well, as I said, I'm inspired by the whole world that we've had in the last thousands of years of Western culture of, of fantasy adventures. I mean, fairy stories are fantasies. Children's books like the Narnia books are fantasies. Um, as I said, Odysseus, Beowulf, the the, the sagas, the Eddas of Iceberg. Yeah. The Narnia uh, books are great. Yeah, like, they are. I, I'm not I'm not a Christian, but you know, they're, they're it's a great story. Yeah, um, the fourth book again becomes a lecture, which is sad. But the the adventures are su superb. I loved them as a kid, and I love things like Norton Justice, the the Phantom Tollbooth. When I got that, I read it about nine times back to back. I must have been about ten years old. Absolutely, the brilliant wordplay in it. Um, so, I, I mean, I soaked it all up. I, I love Terry Tatch, Terry Pratchett. I, I, have, I haven't uh, read any for a while, but uh, I don't write like him. But you know, people like that and. Um, yeah, all, all uh, Peter S. Beagle's book, The Last Unicorn, which I read many times decades ago, as well as the, the fantasy greats, the obvious ones. Um, so I'm inspired by everyone, but I don't copy. I, I uh, That way you wouldn't write anything worth reading. Uh, but it's all influenced by my culture, our culture. Would you say that it's more like uh, long lines of like Lord of the Rings or Robert E. Howard's Conan? Oh, a bit of both. Um, yeah, I mean, again, this uh, Ready Player One meets Lord of the Rings in Discworld line was actually that sums up quite a lot of it. it although it's not a computer game, it's not set in a dysfunctional future, it's set in a real world where our well, hero... Would you turn it away if a computer com game company came to you and they said, we'd love to adapt your concepts into a game? Here's a Ooh. bunch of money. I'd, well, I, I, I'd, <laughs> oh, wow, what a great idea. No, I'd never thought of that. Um, they... they they would not have to pay me any money because I wouldn't work on it. I just advise, like with the um, oh, I'm doing that's another series I'm doing at the moment, uh, which I've written the first season. It's nothing to do with this thing, but I said to the showrunner, "Look, I don't want to write anything on the second season. Get some other writers in. I'll just sit around and be a script consultant and advice." And uh, and he said, "Great." So you know, if somebody wanted to turn New Rock New Roll into a game, I'd. Uh, and I'd let them get on with it because they're the experts. And you know, I, one of the nice things about being a script writer is you get trained to work as, with other people. You become part of a team, and that is the pleasure of working with good directors, with good actors, with 
good singers and composers. So being a script writer, you know, by trade, you know, if your work was adapted into like either a Netflix series or whatever, would you want to write it? Well, um, yes. Uh, I've, as I said, the, we're doing this as a film. Uh, uh, well, I've written it as a film, and it's uh, sold to the to the producer to be a, a film because he says the whole uh, what's it streaming world has changed. People don't want endless box sets quite so much as they do. They just like a two-hour get-in, get-out adventure movie with a lot happening. And there are some sequels in the pipeline should the first one be a success. So he went that whole way of, um, let's just make this a really tight, adventurous uh, action, comedy, drama, fantasy film. I was happy with that. I think you also got to take that a little bit with the grain of salt because, like, they're always telling, like, you always have, like, the producers or the publishers that are always telling you, look, this is what you need to do. This is what's popular. And then you yeah, yeah. have somebody that does the exact opposite and they'll break out and suddenly they're the next big thing. Oh, completely right. Completely. I just happen to know the guy. We think along the same lines. But look at Game of Thrones. I mean, how easy do you think that was as a sell? It's, I mean, it's really right. impossible. But dragons and on television, what are you it's talking about? It's going to be this long series. It's going to go on forever. wasn't big at the time. In fact, Absolutely. I think fantasy is why stuff like Will the Time got made. Right. And then you can imagine a few years later, people are pitching some domestic sitcom set in Pasadena and people say, well, <laughs> where, where, do, where are the dragons? Come on, we need right, dragons. Right. In it. <laughs> you know? right. So well, in Hollywood, they're always chasing what people have just done. They're very, uh, you know, very they, they, they like the tried and trusted. Yeah, that's kind of unfortunate. But yeah, like after they did The Walking Dead, like how many zombie series were there out? I mean, yeah. none of them were that good. Fortunately, with the fantasy thing, they seem to like go after properties that have already established themselves. Oh, like, yeah. Like The Witcher, Wheel of Time, as opposed to, hey, uh, Game of Thrones is popular. Let's write something like that. Yeah, and they look at the Disney buying the Royal Dahl estate and. Uh... You know, they're just just plowing the same old furrow. The new Wonka film looks sounds terrible. It's had bad I reviews. think Disney's so, gone way downhill, but that's my well, opinion. They, they're just playing safe. Yeah, yeah, uh, and throwing money at something that's well known and and coming up with drivel. Right. Um, well, and, and you look at the stuff that they bought, and they bought it because it's a hot property. But yeah. stuff like the like the Star Wars or the Marvel universe, like. They had people that love that stuff. They had a whole backstory, and they're like, "Yeah, we're just gonna try and like pacify everything and make it like it is, you know, like appeal to as wide of an audience as possible." By doing that, they destroy the the base. Absolutely correct. You know, when I was a kid at university, I would have a book of poetry in one pocket and a novel in the other, and a medieval thing I was and a Marvel comic always tucked inside my somewhere. I was a huge Marvel comic fan. I had the first thirty-five Silver Surfers. Oh, wow. I gave, yeah. I, I gave them to someone to read and I never got them back. <laughs> right. They'd be worth a bit now. Yeah. I, I was a big comic fan. I wanted to be a comic artist originally. Yeah. And like, um, I remember Alan Moore inspired me. Oh, yeah. Like, I still think Alan Moore is like one of the best writers ever. Oh, but, yeah. Absolutely. You know, I, I remember I couldn't decide if I wanted to do art or if I wanted to write. And then I read Watchmen and I was like, I can do both. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Of course yeah. you can. But the thing with Marvel, Marvel's disappeared up its own arsehole. I mean, look at that. The, <laughs> the, latest, the latest Marvel movie has like one-star reviews everywhere. Is it called Miss Marvel or something? And then you look back at how good Tony Stark with Robert Downey Jr. was. Oh, was they great. had, the real, yeah, they had yeah. the real wit. Yeah, and yeah. They just they got it. They got the right guy in the right part at the right time. Thor was great. The, it, yeah. the, the casting was fabulous. I, I was a little bit upset because, like I said, I'm the weakest ever real to miss. I'm like, that's not Thor. But, oh, yes, he know. was. Oh, yes, he was. <laughs> he was great. <laughs> well, he, he did he did a good job. There were a couple of things, but, you know, I was just being a hater about those. But, you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, but anyway, it, the, you can hate on the new stuff, but when they just run out of, they try and create a product and they get us all watching it. And then it just, they cannot think outside the box. It, it worked last time. So, you know, the, oh God, if it works, do it again is the rule in television. Well, it seems like they buy the properties and then they're like, yeah, I'll just run it myself. Right. right. And then they flog it to death. There are, there are exactly. many, many. Uh, many, many great writers here in Hollywood. A really seriously good script writer. Did you see, talking of gothic, did you see Wednesday? No. Oh, man. Well, that's, I, I know my girl did. She she watched it. She said it was pretty good. 
It was, well, it's Tim Burton for a start. Great right. casting. The girl Jenna Ortega, who plays Wednesday, is luminous. Oh, and really? I, years ago, I was when I was in my twenties. I met through my agent. Uh, I went to have a meeting with Jerry O'Hara, who was one of the writers on the Avengers, the original Avengers. And I thought, wow, you know, great. And, and uh, in our meeting, or just social, um, he said, the trouble with writers, young writers these days coming up is is that they have they haven't lived. They've just watched television. They haven't had life experience. And I thought, oh, very interesting. I better go out and get some life experience. Watching Wednesday, I thought, no, he's completely wrong. The young writers who wrote that have had 20, 30 years exposure to great television writing. They soaked it all up. Because right. they've had great TV in front of them for uh, their entire lives, so they know good stuff. I, when they I'd see say it. it's a little bit of both. Like it, I grew up on like isolated army bases, but we'd always go to the library and like I check out this giant stack of books every yeah. week, and I'd read yeah. them all by the end of the week. Yep. So yep. it's like living that fantasy world a little bit, and I also like I built tree forts. I'd be biking around town, so you need a little bit of that lived adventure too. Absolutely, yeah. You, you don't want to just uh, spend your entire life cooped up in a in a room. Right. Um, yeah, where were you in Norway? Brought up? Where were you brought up? Well, no, I, I was brought up in the U.S. My my oh. grandparents moved here from Norway. In okay. fact, they moved here right before the war. Right before World War Two and you know, uh, the Nazis like, good, and Hitler and all that stuff. Good yeah. timing. Good timing. Well, well, <laughs> Christina Muirfeld, who wrote, uh, who designed the cover for New Rock, New Roll, and also the second book. She's just done a lovely cover for that. She's Norwegian. Oh, she, really? lives, she lives in Glasgow. She also works for Marvel, and she's really. I'll send you a link to her site. She's incredible. Okay, awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to do that. I just hear. I hear it's very expensive. Oh know, yeah. Like, like as long as you don't like. You know, buy tons of shit is beautiful. You see lots yeah. of you it's, know it's amazing landscape. It's um yeah, it's ten bucks a beer as well. So my <laughs> w- my wife and daughter, my daughter's a mad keen scuba diver, so she and her mates are going up to Norway on a dive cruise. My wife's going with her next summer when I will be at uh, Worldcon, the the big convention in which is in Glasgow, Christina's new adopted hometown. So. Uh, that, so I'll be up there for that. Uh, well, they'll be in Norway, you know, looking at polar bears and stuff and diving with orcas. I used to and do I, the uh, Scottish Tattoo Convention. I did it like seven years in a row. Uh-huh. It was, Where was, it was that? in Edinburgh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Edinburgh's pretty great. Crazy during the festival. I've done a few festivals and it's exhausting. But, uh, Beautiful forward- area, though. It's like uh, oh, just yeah. all the landscape and the hills yeah. and, you know. I, I love Scotland. It's just, it's one of the last wildernesses in Europe in many ways. It's you just, know, we, I went up to see the Loch Ness. Unfortunately, yeah, I did not yeah. see the monster, but, you know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Better luck next time. Yeah. Uh, but I'm really looking forward. The fantasy, I've only been to one fantasy convention so far. It was great fun. There's another one coming up in February in uh, Boston. Boston in February. Ooh, how exciting. <laughs> no, it'll be great. You have no have, idea how cold it is in Boston, although I've been in what, Canada and that's even worse. I've I hitchhiked across Canada when I, when I was 18. It was in March, and that was pretty bloody nippy, I tell you. But oh, if you they, think March is bad, that is uh, nothing. Oh, uh, listen, I tell you, I got to Calgary, and a week later I was on the North Pole, on Prince, pa- <laughs> on Prince Patrick Island itself, which is where the North Pole was. It's, it moves, not the right. not the. Not the top North Pole, but the magnetic North Pole. Right, that was right. a great, great adventure for an eighteen-year-old kid. So yeah, I've been, I've been to cold places, and it's I love it. But Boston apparently has great oyster bars, so I'm. Uh, yeah. Well, I've been to Boston much. I've been to Canada a bunch of times. Like, Toronto is beautiful. Yeah, I see yeah. Toronto is kind of like a cleaner New York. Yes, <laughs> especially in, in the movies, it is New York. <laughs> right, <laughs> they shoot, they shoot, that's they shoot true. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they shoot it all the time. Yeah. All right, man. So I don't want to keep you here all day, but uh, let me oh, know fine. how people can get a hold of you and how they can find yourself and throw oh. money at you. Uh, well, if first of all, if you want to check it out for free, there you can get a free audio sample read by me or a free chapter, which is in a PDF form. And you can download those or listen to them or read them online at www.richardsparks.com. No E in Sparks, S P A R K S. Uh, we also have social media, but I can n- never remember what they are. I think it's Richard Sparks. <laughs> uh, Richard Sparks underscore author is Instagram, I think. And well, do you have an like- author's page, like an Amazon? Well, uh, uh, not yet, because the book has isn't out, but that will come in due course when the 
we build up the, the sequels. RichardSparks.com is, <laughs> I got, uh, I, 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 it turns out that the people who designed the first website for me were scammers. They built a nice website, then they kept coming at me for more and more money. Yeah, you told, you told me, yeah. And they oh, were, you copyrighted it. You, know, they, like, they, you have they, to copyright your website. It's like, yeah. what the fuck is that? It's yeah. impossible. You can't copyright a website. They came off, they wanted £6,350 plus 20% VAT to copyright the website. So I said, look, I've been a writer for decades. So you don't. That's not how it works. Right, copyright. Right. Anyway, so then they locked me out of the back end of the website, so my assistant can't get in and <laughs> fix things. So uh, we're, we're having a new um, a, a holding page done by some reputable uh, people that my assistant's worked with before, and uh, that will be up soon. So what was a big multi-page website is now going to be just a holding page, but you can get your free samples there. So richardsparks.com. Uh, the book's up on Amazon.co.uk as well as Amazon.com and Barnes and & Noble and all the merchant sites. Um, uh, and tell everyone, what's the name of the book? New Rock, New Roll, R-O-L-E. Uh, a rock is a planet, right? New Third rock from the sun. So right. they're, on, he's, they're on a new planet. They got their new role. Let's go. Is it going to be uh, available on Kindle and paperback? Yep. Yeah. Uh, uh, like the three... Like a- like if you want a Kindle, could you go to also like Barnes and Noble or some Max yeah, yeah, yeah. or whatever? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You just go to whatever merchant website you want. You get it as a, a it's called an EPUB. That go, works on Kindle or um, Nook or iPad. Oh, they have so many now. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Whatever you want, and um, like yes, over, that's, Overcast, Smashwords. Apple, I yeah. I can't keep up, but the EPUB works with us. You can order that. You can order a physical book that will come to you by mail, dropped on your doorstep by a friendly pigeon. Or you can get, <laughs> or you can get the audio book with me reading it, which was, um, which is, you know, it's slightly strange because I'm not an actor, but you know, people say, well, authors read their books all the time. And it actually gave me a lot of fun because I was then listening to people reading their own books. Like well, Mel- you have that more formal voice, like with a little bit of the like, uh, British it- accent and it sounds very acute. Like, I would never read my own books. I have my own books as audio, but I would never read them. Well, I've done it. Couldn't afford a real actor, so I did it. <laughs> but then I've been listening to Mel Brooks reading his book and Seth Rogen reading his book right. and getting tips from people reading their own works. And it's been, it, it was a journey. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I've heard, uh, it, it kind of varies. Like, I've heard that Stephen King should not read his own books. You know? Well, <laughs> no. Well, he's, he, he's, pre- he's pretty good at what he does. Now, my agent said, uh, well, I usually tell people at readings, two paragraphs and take questions. But she said, but in your case, you know, a lot of writers are shy and uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm outgoing. I don't mind making a fool of myself in public. So uh, <laughs> I, th- I thought we'd well, give it a go. Right. Yeah. But uh, it, the people who are shy, actually, they make more of a fool of themselves sometimes. Because, ah. like, you know, if, if, if you're social and amicable or whatever, it's like, okay, that just passes, you know. I see your point. Yes. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, you know, Facebook, a website. Um, I think that, a- yeah, there's Richard Sparks, author on Facebook. I've got my own Richard Sparks page on Facebook, but I never, I go on it once a year to thank people for wishing me happy birthday. I just, <laughs> I, yeah, I leave that to my assistant. She's very good at that. And, uh, um, it's Are very you on a Twitter or X now? Oh, I, I think we got a threads account. I don't know about Twitter. Tw- Twitter reads. I don't know. I'm just doing what I'm told. I think <laughs> I think it might be up there. Um, you know, this is all fairly new to me, so I hope I, I'm not probably... doing the TikTok dances. You know, the, <laughs> the little two right. one. You know. Yeah, no, I should pick up the old five string banjo. Go yeah, on, like, oh, you, yeah. Right, yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> you don't eagle there, you know. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, no, no. Um, I have uh, clearly, as you've worked out by now, I have no shame, but there is a limit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, is it, is it a famous quote like "Once you hear banjos, run"? <laughs> oh, 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 I got a T-shirt. I got a T-shirt. Some two people in a canoe. It says, "Right, right, paddle faster." I hear yeah, banjos. Yeah, yeah, deliverance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right, yeah. So- well, thank you for doing this interview. I appreciate it. You know, like, thanks for having me. Dan. I'm it's- glad. I'm glad that you're a social person because some people are so awkward. It's like pulling straw to get you know anything out of them. Like you oh. talk to them like. All right, man. 
<laughs> oh dear. Well, I, I just love. I'm just so grateful to have found my lovely world that I can revel in and to have to be writing these stories. I'm not pretending it's always been easy, but I love a challenge. I mean, for example, the the moon is an important chap character in the third book, and I would go outside and look up at her, and it'd be another full moon, and I still hadn't figured out how it all fitted together. And one when I got there, I went out and it was the full moon. I said, "Thank you, we got there," but it you know it took took a while to. There's a lot well, of well, life is a rocky road, but you know, yeah. it's it's kind of a, is a cl total cliche, but it's like all that stuff actually gives you a better story to tell. Oh, completely, and. Kierkegaard was right. Life is lived forwards, but only understood backwards. And so you look at you look back and go, oh yeah, that that worked out. That was easy. But I'm now looking forward in book five and going, well, I know it's going to end up. That's where it lands in four hundred pages. But how we get there, I've got my adventures, and well, you know, you just follow your nose, and then often you have to throw stuff away and just keep on keeping on. Okay. Yeah. Awesome, man. All right. So um, again, the right how people can get a hold of you. Yeah, they'll contact us through richardsparks.com. Uh, you can do that or um, just come. You know, I'll be at conventions. In, I've got four coming up so far this year. Uh, uh, what do you have coming up? Uh, Bo Bo Box Zone, I think it's called, in Boston in February. Then Seattle, Tacoma in April. Uh, North American Science Fiction in Buffalo in July. And then the big one, which is Worldcon in Glasgow uh, in uh -huh. August. And that'll be fun. There's some big writers going to be there. So I'm looking forward to meeting them. Big Great. names. Awesome, man. Yeah, thank you very much for being on this. Um, I appreciate the discussion. It was awesome. Do you have anything else to say? No, it's just thanks for having me. It's just, just been a lot of fun. Okay, thanks. Thanks.